Greetings and welcome to Change the World. My name is Guy Dornsey and this is the show where we explore local people in the region who have big, bold ideas for making a difference in the world and tackling some of the numerous problems that we seem to be facing these days. Today my guest is John Horn, who carries the title of the Social Planner for Nanaimo. And you've got a background in the nonprofit sector as a social worker, as, as a um, family counseling, born in Zimbabwe, working with all sorts of government agencies. But for viewers, what is a social planner? Is it, is it George Orwell in 1984, or is it, or is it something more <laughs> friendly? It's not as Machiavellian as all that, no. Yeah. It's a little more friendly, and my uh, role as social planner is essentially to give advice to council around the social issues that impact us. Yes. Things like homelessness or affordable housing. And then um, provide uh, counseling uh, guidance and advice to council, but also to work with all my colleagues in the nonprofit sector right. to implement services and facilities and actions that are going to address those social issues. Yeah. So, so the nonprofit sector in the city of Nanaimo, I'm guessing you're dealing with 30 or 40 nonprofits? Probably, yeah. If you actually look up the number of nonprofit societies in the several hundreds, yes. but it actually includes a lot of small um, the, sports organizations yeah. and these sorts of things. But yeah. the social service sector, there's probably about 40 nonprofits wow. that focus on the charitable yeah. issues. You know? And if we, if we go back, say, 100 years, we just have a, maybe two or three charities dealing with stuff? Salvation Army, um, the classics, you know, yes. those, uh, those are the ones that dealt with everything. And then there were everything. the service clubs, the, the Lions, the Rotary, yes. and groups like that. Yeah. The Rotaries and the Lions Clubs tended to really focus a lot on uh, the individual need. Yes. So they would help people go to school or pay yes. you know, various things for various people. And then they did infrastructure development like parks. And we see their, yes. their infrastructure still in our city, playgrounds, yeah. parks, fields. What they didn't really address was the systemic nature of inequality yeah. or the systemic reasons why people were poor or lacked food. So that right. was um, one of the things that the governments, you know, had to take on yeah. is trying to understand what are the basic underlying pressures that drive people into those places yeah. and then how do we change those pressures and help the people who are in distress. And there's course. still a perspective that basically says that social problems like not having enough money, poverty, homelessness, they're an individual failure and the people should just you know pull themselves up by the bootstraps and government helping them just makes life easy. Mm -hmm. So it, we're move, moving away from that way of thinking I hope? We are. We have had the, the well. We've had the luxury of having some experimental historical, you know, processes that we've been able to watch. Yeah. For example, we can see that the prosperity that's come into the first world, if I can call it that, yes. the northern, western world. Massive if you prosperity, will, frankly. Um, people thought originally that if everyone was well off, there would be no crime because crime was ultimately going to be driven by scarcity and, and inequality. Yes. It turns out that's not entirely true. We still have crime, yes. even if we are a relatively wealthy place. Yeah. And in fact, there's poorer places with lower crime rates than we have. So yeah. the link between how much money people have yeah. and the social issues seems so clear cut to the Victorians and the Edwardians. Yes. But it turns out to be not so clear cut to the moderns. Well, it was Samuel Smiles, the self-help. Like, the yeah. ultimately, you look after yourself, you pull yourself up and make yourself good, and it's your fault if you fail. Yes. I still hear that in some conservative circles, that yeah. it's a personal responsibility thing. And, yeah. and, but I wouldn't want to flip the other way and say, well, everything has to be done by the government and personal yeah. responsibility doesn't matter because there are, it, there it, are it, balance. There's a huge impact. When, when people believe that the government is going to solve their problems, I've been in communities where that's the case, and they're essentially helpless to yeah. make changes for their own lives. And they're yeah. being disempowered by this notion to an extraordinary degree. So it's a very powerful idea. Yeah. And one that I would really, you know, in rejecting the notion that it's just all yeah. our fault when we fall between the cracks. Yeah. Equally, I would reject the notion that it, the government's the solution. But when I grew up it's in- it's so in disempowering. I grew up in Britain and after the, the chronic problems in the cities and the slums and the poverty, you know, the government started building council housing. Yes. Seriously, serious affordable housing constructed by the government, but they also controlled it all. Yep. And you couldn't even paint your front door no. yourself. And if the government worker did come and paint it two years after you complained, it was the fixed <laughs> color. Yeah. And it was really Stalinist and in mm -hmm. terms of its, you know, you freedom, you're not allowed to have freedom because we're looking after you. That's right. yeah, yeah. And I'm not a Maggie Thatcher fan, but yeah. when she l said you can buy your own house, mm -hmm. for a lot of people, now I can experience some freedom in my life. Yes, yeah. Then I, the, I found that same thing in council housing estates. I worked in many of them. And yeah. Many of them would wait years for a council staff person 
to show up and fix a thing. Yeah. But really, if you and I were encountering that, we would have probably just fixed it in a day or two. You would, you do it yourself. We just would have go and get the bit and done the thing you and fix it. You just do it. There they yes. waited years sometimes without a light or heat yeah. or basic things like a front door. Yeah. They would wait years. And I was just always astonished so, so by that. So when we're dealing with homelessness and affordable housing stuff now, is most of the housing being channeled through nonprofits which empower people the, rather than the government control yes, thing? Yes, yeah. There's um, very, 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 very little stock that's actually controlled directly by government. Yeah. And most of it's run by societies, and, and they have those kind of goals yeah. and objectives in mind and have some sense of how to empower versus yeah. disempower people. So Yeah, yeah. so we're, we're, we're having this interview on the very day when the provincial election is being decided. Yes. <laughs> and at the time of talking, we still don't know who's going to form a minority government. We know yes. it will be a minority. Right. If it's the NDP, mm -hmm. and they've presumably with the Greens, and they've committed to build 11,000 units of housing a year. Well, they yes. said they said 110,000 over 10 years. Right. Those 11,000 units, are they mostly going to be run by the nonprofit sector? Yes, and I believe that the NDP would probably take the similar approach. It's vastly more efficient than running it under government yeah. auspices because of the cost structures are radically different. Yes. You have a genuinely charitable impulse that gets channeled into nonprofits. Yes. So that reduces their costs, they get additional benefits that they don't accrue to governments at all. Yeah. So there's a whole swack of benefits that accrue when you use a nonprofit society yeah. that you'll never get when you're a government entity. Right. So even just on the pay scale piece, you, it's it's more efficient. You're not run. supporting bureaucrats at 80,000 a year. Terrible bureaucrats. <laughs> <laughs> who, would, who would wish to support them? No, I know, I know. So anyway, in prep for this, you gave me a list of six topics that you are really working with. They're homelessness, the survival sex trade, yep. affordable housing, yep. isolated seniors, youth engagement, and vibrant public spaces. So yes. you pick one you want to start with, then I'll pick the next one. Right. <laughs> and I'll yeah. try and ration the time, right? All right. So I'll roll the first three into one because, I, I, you know, in my work, I, I've come to see that we're facing two crises. They're not of the I'm making, but are generic to Western community, like mm -hmm. North America well, in particular. Yes. One is that we have a significant crisis in terms of the opioid crisis, which everyone is talking about now, yes. with fentanyl overdoses. Yes. But it's also, that's a subset of a much larger problem around substance use in our, in our communities, in our yeah. society, which is having a devastating effect on a small group of people, but a, a huge impact. Yes. That group is also being hammered by the price of housing. And that group is also the group that's largely responsible for filling the ranks of the survival sex trade. Uh, so you can trace a lot of the issues mm -hmm. that I spend most of my day working on to the impact of substance use. Yeah. If, if all the individuals in our community right now who are currently homeless were to cease and desist using substances, yes. we would then find that a smaller proportion of those were being uh, driven by mental illness yes. and that we would have services and provision and supports for those folks. Yeah. But you'd find the, less, the rest of that group would, would sort of find themselves again and go on with the things that we all want them to do. Obtaining employment, going back to school, yes. raising families, living more, mm, guess, less exuberant outdoor lives. Yeah, <laughs> less exuberant. That's one way of putting yeah. it, yes. Um, so I've seen that, that one of the things that's really difficult for us to untangle is that that issue about the prevalence and, and, and the uh, amount of substances available to people is not going away and it's not diminishing. Yeah. And the human appetite to use substances does not seem to be diminishing either. Yeah. So there's this escalating piece that's I going mean, along in the background, of which we really have yeah, very I mean, little I mean, control. I mean, if we, we, you put affordable housing at the core of it, but just to stay with the, the, subst the substances piece, I mean, I, we're both part of the generation that normalized smoking marijuana. Yes, and, and use of drugs as being a good thing in some ways. Yes, right? but the, when I grew up, it was like smoking tobacco at school. That was the, the risky, right. deviant behavior. Yeah. We then normalize. So if now marijuana is the normal behavior, then you wanted to push the edge a bit more yeah. because you want to be cool or whatever. And one day you wake up and you've taken carfentanil or fentanyl and you're dead. Yes. How do you see this thing ending? I don't see it ending well. And I say that because not only is the uh, types and, uh, and variation in the products being provided to consumers, I'm going to call them that. Yes. So th uh, there's a chemist inventing a new drug every couple of hours, literally in this world, right? Yeah. That'll get you all high in some way. And so the plethora of, of substances is vastly different than it was when we grew up. Yeah. We probably had three or four basic choices if we wanted to alter our consciousness. Yeah. Now there's hundreds, and they're manufactured by people who have no skills in whatsoever. So that's a big part of it, is the production cycle has changed. But the methods and um, uh, processes that are used by the people who benefit from selling drugs, and let's call that, let's say, organized crime or any of those places, 
they have adopted the techniques of big business, which is produce at scale, uh, distribute in, in international networks. Like there are very, very little difference between a major right. corporation and a very large drug cartel. I, except that in, in an awful corporation, you don't want to kill your customers. That's right, but the cartels don't much mind, right? Because there's another one lined up behind them. Yeah, so, so you have this enormously sophisticated production and distribution network, and that's very different yes. from when we grew up, when it was very well, amateurish, yeah, right? It was our, yeah. Now they can import however they want, whatever they want, into your community in a matter of hours. And if we, if we say it's coming in from China and we block the postage yeah. there, well, they ship it via Bangladesh Absolutely. or Turkey, or there's yeah. 190 countries to choose from. There is. And so that's one of the things that we face, which we didn't face in previous generations, is that they're very sophisticated at this now yeah. and very productive. And as from a business model perspective, it's enormously profitable and a very efficient way to do business. For do us we, as communities, though, we're feeling the brunt of that. Do we need to have stronger punitive approach on the dealers and actually to give a message that this is akin to manslaughter? I think there's probably very little impact you'll have when you do that mm. because the punitive measures are in place in many places. Yeah. And yet the, the trade continues. I think there's, it's not the production side that has to shift. What really will change the yeah. game is the nature of our desire for right. these things and our so willingness as consumers to make better choices. So you know the work of Gabor Maté? Yes. Probably. Now, he was arguing that with the core drug addicts, you've got this deep existential hole inside from yes. non-attachment to something that makes you feel warm and bonded, yeah. like whether it's a mother or something like that. And so taking the drug gives you that feeling for a while. Yeah. But there's also a group for whom it's purely fun let's try something out and let's mm -hmm. you know take a risk and be a teenager and be a yeah. well not just teenagers but right through sure. even we see corporate executives you know snorting coke and stuff like that Absolutely. do the two groups need different approaches i would say so because there is a group who's whose life has been very difficult yes and they have taken to using substances as a way of dulling the pain and yes. i think it's a, probably a pretty rational even though it doesn't look like it on the surface yeah. and as a social worker i've always try to figure out well, why do people do what they do and yes. usually they have a good reason why yeah. they do what they do it's very seldom irrational it just doesn't look that way to yeah. us right choosing that instead of wallowing in your own angst might be a pretty rational yeah. choice for someone who's really well, distressed well i remember being in severe distress when one of my girlfriends was having an open affair under my i was living right. with her and said blah 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 we don't know the details but i didn't have any mental tools to deal with it i used right. to smash my head against the wall right in the way that small children do. Right. I, I, did, I didn't know what else to do. Right. If I'd, and I didn't have access to drugs, but I could easily, right. well, that'll deal with this one, yeah. and make it go away, because I didn't know how to handle that degree of jealousy yeah. and pain combined into this horrible, toxic knot, yes. right? right? Luckily, I get a bit older, and you learn how to, yep. wisdom, but it's, yeah. when, you're in, when you're in your teens and early 20s, you can be an emotional bundle of stuff and not understand it. Mm -hmm. There is a suggestion that our social connectedness matters in these regards. How yes. susceptible are people to the influence of, I think I'll take up a crack habit. Yeah. It, it, it devolves sometimes to their sense of connectedness to the world. Right. If they don't have that feeling I'm connected I to people, completely with you there. then that opens the door, which is really easy yeah. for things to slip in. Yeah, bad so habits, for example. And I, so that's a piece a, of the puzzle. I lived in a village in Senegal ah, for nice. three months, completely in the bush, right. living as they had been probably for the last thousand years. Right. And uh, there was a 15 year old, this is all little huts close together, 15 year old girl had a big row with her father, right. stormed out of the house, right. went down the street, and moved into her uncle's house three doors down. <laughs> right, <laughs> exactly. And so she stayed with the uncle for three weeks while yeah. they calmed down and then moved back in. Yeah. In today's world, you storm out of the home, yeah. you're gonna go downtown, yes. and instead of bonding with the uncle, yeah. you're gonna bond with the street people who yeah. give you a kind of friendship, and then Absolutely. you're getting locked into that lifestyle yeah. with, with drugs and stuff. Yeah, we see that pretty frequently, of course. I mean, there's a receptive audience, there's yeah. a culture you can assimilate into, there's a whole world so that you, who will look we, after you in a funny sort of way. So, so, and our genetically and in evolutionary terms, we've lived in close villages yes. for 99.99999% of yeah. our existence since yeah. we came down from the trees. When you're in the village of maybe 200 people, mm -hmm. you knew everyone, they knew you, everyone's got their eyes out. Yeah. Now you can live in a village of single family mother, one other adult mm -hmm. you're mixing with, especially yeah. if you know, you're moving a moving house and stuff like that. So how do we build 
this rebuild social yeah. community in that's our neighborhoods. A, that's the question for our time because we're, we're doing this really radical experiment right now around urbanization, which has been going on for two, you know, yes. 200 years. Yes. But we're starting to see that there's a set of, if you will, pathologies that come with this massive concentration yeah. of humans into small areas, right? And we have no other choice, though, because there's just so darn many humans yes, on the planet. And it's more intelligent to live in cities. It's than much to... more efficient ecologically. Yes. Sorts. There's yes. a million reasons why it's a good thing. But we still have to work out how it is we, uh, we recognize and address the underlying pathologies that come yes. with that urbanization. Yeah. One of them is this lack of connectivity. Yes. When there's 90,000 people in your town, little one like this, you can't know everybody. Yeah. But at the same time, you can have a network of people around yes. you that you can tap into. They're just not going to have that proximity to you. Yeah. They're not going to be next door. They so may be across town. When my wife and I lived in Victoria, we actually organized the first street party on that particular street. Nice. And so I went and knocked on everyone's door. Nice. And there was a retired teacher who, when I spoke to her, told me this story that a while back she said a furniture van had moved in across the road. We had come up. So she'd gone across the road and said, welcome to the neighborhood. And they said, that's very kind of you, but actually we've been living here seven years and we're just moving out. <laughs> like, Thanks ouch. for coming over though, right? Ouch, and she didn't, hadn't even got right. face to face is recognition. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And so the flip side of that is that I give a lot of talks recently and I've been saying, showing two slides to people. Right. One of a standard suburban street with the houses on the road, probably not even a sidewalk, and the other of what's called a, po a neighborhood, a, a pocket neighborhood, mm -hmm. when the houses face a shared green space oh, yeah. and the cars in come around the back just for parking. And, there's, and I said, which of these would you rather, if you're going to move house, which would you rather live on? And 100%, mm -hmm. like six times now, have wanted to live on the houses facing the green space because they know they're going to connect with each other more right. and have more neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. But, and if we carry on increasing Canada's population at 1% a year, in 100 years' time, there'll be like 95 million yes. Canadians. So we've got 60 million new homes we're going to build. Right. And if they're all built on the old style, we're going to get more alienation. If mm. they're built on a community style, mm -hmm. so the actual planning yes. makes you meet each other. Mm -hmm. Now, I do believe that there's a lot to be said for the physical architecture of a neighborhood yes. being conducive or not yes. to, to, to casual interaction between yes. the people living in that neighborhood. And our, our current neighborhoods, most of the time, don't really serve that function very well. Right. And, and I see us shifting towards better design in that yeah. sense. So my belief, though, is that um, while I do have that input into the development of our community around yes. how do we make more friendly communities and yes. more social communities, I believe it's the little things that pull people out of their houses. And it's not necessarily um, can be laid all at the feet of architecture. Yeah. So for example, one of the things I do is a little library program where we build little bookcases, yes. we provide them to people who adopt it, yes. they put it in the front lawn, and then the neighborhood can come and get a book, yeah. leave a book. So it's like yeah. this lending library. And when I talk to you, he's got one of these, he said, I know all the neighbors now. Right. They all know my name. I know their yeah. name. We know what they read. They know what I they read. Do. We swap books. Well, it, We're now conversing on a regular yeah. basis, which didn't happen. And all it took was a $35 yes. investment in the pieces of wood and a door, yes. right? So in, in, and so really small things can shift. In my neighborhood, which is the Yellow Point area, all right. south of Cedar, it's all five-acre lots, very rural. Right. Not a single place for people in Yellow Point to meet each other yeah. anywhere. Right. And when I wanted to sort of organize something, there's nowhere to put notices up. Gotcha. So I thought at yeah. every mailbox, where you've got clustered mailboxes, a notice board yeah. where people can post notices about what's happening in the neighborhood. Like I've got, you know, spare eggs this week, or we've got some right. compost to spare, yes. or things like that. Yeah. And the other point is that um, a colleague or someone I know down in Davis, California, built a subdivision on very progressive social right. lines. Right. And he had the houses it's facing... It's a city, Davis. So. This is called village, village Homes in okay. Davis. He had the houses facing each other in a cluster of eight. Yep. He never designed the green space between the houses right. so the neighbors would be forced to get together. Right. And they discovered this, that say it's a Friday night yep. and you want to invite friends to a barbecue. If you're going to have the barbecue in your backyard, yeah. you've got to cut the grass and yeah. trim the roses right, right, and fussy right. it up. Yeah. But if the barbecue is in a common space, right. it just happens it just every is. Friday night right. and people just gather. Right. And so it's, it's, it's the same as your... Mm -hmm. Your little bookshop, yeah. bookshelf, but you've got more excuse to linger because you That's bring right. out a beer and put yeah. something on the barbecue. 
So we have a scheme that we're putting forward for a little bit of funding, and we'll see if this happens. But we began to think that, yes, that books was a good idea, but yes. it's just a very basic way to do it. We thought we'd like to have what they call in Britain the big meal. In other words, we're going to have community yes. meals. So we're going to go into a neighborhood, and we're going to bring everyone out for breakfast first time. Yes. Really light, stand up, walk around, uh, and then meet your neighbors over coffee and muffins or whatever yes. the case may be. And then we'll follow up with the second meal, which is lunch, which is a little more intimate, a little more engaged, yes. a little more facey-facey. And then we'd have a third meal, which is a dinner, which is going to be a sit-down dinner, white tablecloth. So where do you do it? So then? we're going to pick three neighborhoods in the city. Yes. And we're going to confine it to one block. OK, so it's And maybe even one street, yes. And you bring a tent if it's raining? Yes, okay. and, and it doesn't have to have a park or a gathering place. Yes. In fact, we're going to look for neighborhoods or areas where there is no natural gathering yes. space. Because that, those neighbors don't actually bump into each other very yes. much, right? Yeah. So our goal is to use food as a lure to get people engaged. And then yes. lastly, we're going to say to them, we've had three meals together. We're going to give you $1,000 to make your neighborhood more socially friendly kind of place. What would you like to do with it? Yes. Kind of getting them to carry on after the meals. they get meals. to choose yes. how they spend that money. Brilliant. That's right. Brilliant. So we get them all to know each other. And then here's a common task. Yeah. And then we're going to sit back and see, come back a year later, say, yes. and to see, did that create the kind of social relationships yeah. I think we need more of in yeah. our community, or did it not? And this will be so, the experiment for us. So in the, in the book that I wrote called Journey to the Future, which is a novel set in Vancouver in the year 2032, right. that's exactly what's happening. Oh, very good. I've and um, the first weekend in August was a street party day for the whole city. Right. And so it, everyone does that on that. So it's similar to, you mentioned okay. in Britain, the thing called the big meal. The big lunch, which is they, they the call it, lunch. yeah. And that's one day a year, and yes. everyone on the street, and it's... And everyone, everyone shares a lunch on this. Lunch. Yeah, that's, that's they a get fascinating the tables out, idea. And they yeah. bring their own food out. Yes. Yeah. And also had a thing with a, actually the city organized, this is Vancouver, it's bigger than right. Nanaimo, a contest with prizes where streets could compete to win $5,000 oh, yeah. for the best neighborhood improvement program. Right. And all, everyone, yeah. it's, it's a, similar to your give them $1,000 and yes. see what happens yeah. to it, right? Yeah. I'm a yeah. big believer in that kind of connectedness. The, the other thing that connects people, and I've discovered this to my chagrin, is that I will go into neighborhoods where there is no cohesive neighborhood association. Yes. And the neighbors have been trying to get one together, which yes. is the typical structure that they create in yes. order to, to engage with neighbors, right? Yes. And then they can go and advocate for things from City Hall, et cetera, et cetera. So I would go into neighborhoods where there were none of that existed. And then I would introduce the notion of, we're going to build some affordable housing yes. in your neighborhood, or we're going to put a, an emergency shelter in your neighborhood, yes. or some sort of social service. Well, that drew all the neighbors together in opposition <laughs> to my, you know, my ideas, right? So I thought, all of a sudden, even though I was like, oh gosh, now I have a whole bunch of people opposing me, <laughs> yes. I've created, create community by I've default. created a fantastic social connectedness. Of course, you could, you could do something obscure, like we're going to build a nuclear power plant on your yeah. neighborhood, and everyone's going to, whoa, yeah, that's right. yeah, you exactly. can't do that. Yeah, yeah, I could just use a false thing, yeah. Yes. So <laughs> but when, that's another way of co people cohese around so something that they get excited about in, or upset yeah. about. In the city of Victoria, so, as opposed to Greater Victoria, every single bit of geography is defined into a community association. Right. And no development proposal can go ahead until it's been before the community association. Yeah. And so no one's left out. Now, in other areas, Saanich, North Saanich, it's, it's all loosey-goosey. Yes. And Nanaimo, it's loosey-goosey. What if Nanaimo was to formally declare, you know, we're going to have boundaries so that everyone is has the option to be part of that. And we have our city divided up into neighborhood associations. Okay. <clears throat> what we see, though, is that neighborhoods that are older and more established, and I'm going to pick on the South End Community Association, yes. which is uh, Halliburton Street in that area, yes. they're really cohesive and they know each other. Right. And partly because they're under stress. Right? Yes. They have a little bit of a street scene. They have um, this is and that's yeah. going on down there. And God bless them, it's a lovely neighborhood. Yeah. But the neighbors do come together because they have areas of mutual concern. Right. When we get into other neighborhoods where there isn't any stressors, okay, you gotta then there's no one who wants to take on the job necessarily of leading the charge about forming yeah. a neighbor. So we do find it a struggle to get neighborhood associations yes. up and running and continuously yeah. running. My, my understanding is that in any neighborhood, 20% of the people will be the kind of people willing to sit yes. on that. And there's, on every street, there's going to be some people and I would wager mostly women who just are natural connectors. Yes. They just love yeah. nothing more than chatting and gossiping. That's Other right. people like myself are stuck in my books and got yeah. to get the work done. Yeah. And, and it's how do you draw those people out yeah. and let them, give them a role to do. Yes. And say, you know, your job's to organize a street party, but we'll help you in these ways. Yeah. 
Yeah, and sometimes they'll organically emerge uh, due to circumstances. Yes. Or sometimes you have to lure them out and yeah. can kind of support a, them in, in doing the role. It's more than block watch, which is just like keep the crime yeah. out. It's something yeah. positive it and nurturing. Yeah. How many neighborhoods are going to have the $1,000 offered to them? How many Three. streets? Three streets. Three. And I wouldn't even scale it as large as neighborhoods because that's too big for a community yes. meal, you know? So we're really no, it's gonna, just a street. We're really going to pick a street. Yeah, that makes a sense. A one totally. block stretch. Because then so you also know, try that, you know on a street, once you've met someone, yes. and I say, look, hi, I'm Guy or John, yeah. greetings. <laughs> we're never going to pass each other but without a without hey. a greeting yeah exactly we've got yeah, two minutes yeah. left oh my goodness how time flies it does. let's talk about vibrant public spaces yes well, you want to do that go, or do you have it. another two topic minutes. no go for vibrant oh, okay. public spaces two minutes i think that one of the things that we don't do very well in north america is vibrant public spaces and i've spent a lot of time in europe touring in public squares in france and, and italy and germany like yes. they know how to do it over there right they've been doing it for centuries and we have not hit the mark yet yeah. on creating a, a multitude of vibrant public spaces. Yeah. So I know there are vibrant public spaces here, absolutely, yeah. but nowhere near the breadth and extent that we should have. And so right. part of what I think is a big part of our social connectedness yeah. is creating those public spaces that draw yes. people to them. And if you get the and formula right, the like Victoria's um, in a walkway around the harbor, yes. it works, it does. but they have Cent Centennial Square, which yeah. Doesn't work. Centennial Square Diana, does not work. Diana Crawl Plaza yeah. is like. Yeah, it hadn't worked either, hasn't worked. right? So it's a very subtle art, mm -hmm. and, and it's a hit and miss proposition sometimes. And what's, your, what's the magic to make it happen? I think there's two magic things that have to happen. One is you really have to think about the scale and the, and the feel of a space, yeah. which is very subtle, yes. but it's not um, unscientific. I mean, there was just things you can identify in the landscape that scare you and don't scare you, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, uh, secondly, we really have to pay much more attention to not being led by the needs of we need hardscape so it can be power washed, oh, right? right? Yes. There's often yeah. operational needs, yeah. but we should be led by what draws humans to convene together, yeah. and then start with that. And that's often yeah. not the beginning question we ask. Yeah. So that's sort of the shift. Well, I, I, look, I, I wish we had another hour because we're just yeah. getting into this yeah. fun stuff, and, it, and we could play with slides and we could redesign mm -hmm. this. Now, yes, but anyway, <laughs> my guest today has been John Horn. The, um, social planner for the city of Nanaimo. Um, if you enjoy this kind of discussion and you'd like to come on the show, get in touch with us with the email you'll see on the screen. My name's Guy Dauncey and this has been the show Change the World and tune in next week for another scintillating discussion. Thank you. <laughs>